Hey, welcome Intermedia Partners. Uh, my name is Craig Woods. Thanks for joining us today. We have a great session on security, uh, a lot of activity, a lot of, lot of new things that are coming up and things that we want to remind you about. I'm joined today by Alex Smith, who's the Senior Director of Product Management for Security, and Nina Underover, who's a Product Manager on some of our critical security products. And we have a jam-packed agenda for you today. So I'm going to get things moving pretty quickly. We're going to try to answer your questions during the session if we can. Please let us know. We love to get feedback, and we'll ask for this at the end as well, but love to get feedback about what we're covering. Um, and if you have special things that, that you want us to attend to, please please let us know. We're going to be monitoring the Q&A feature, which is built into the top of the screen. Uh, so we'll rely on that to see the questions. And we'll try to respond during the session if we can uh, as we're going through the topics. But then hopefully we'll have sufficient time at the end for a good Q&A session. We also have a number of other people from Intermedia uh, participating in this. So we'll be monitoring the Q&A and we'll also be doing some follow-up. So please get your questions in. And if we're not able to cover it during the session, which we'll try to do, we'll follow up to try to get all of your questions answered. Um, and again, you should have you should be familiar with the AnyMeeting interface for using phone or computer audio. Um, but, uh, but please, we're very interested in your feedback on today's session. All right, so here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about some new AI protection, some new AI technology that's getting introduced uh, into email protection for Exchange. The announcements for that have just gone out. You, sh you should have received or should be on your in your inbox on behalf of your customers. Uh, and there's a lot going on there that, that Alex and uh, that Alex, Alex is going to cover, uh, and I'll introduce that. Then you should also have received some notifications about user-based encryption. We've done an, an end-of-life notification, which you should have received, should also have been in your, in, uh, in your mailbox last week. We also have, related to that, some upcoming enhancements to policy-based encryption that we want you to know about because the encryption topic, user-based and policy-based, kind of go together. Um, and so we want to provide as complete a picture as we can. I want to talk about what's happened with advanced email protection for Office 365 that you should be aware of to help clients that are on 365. Uh, and then, you know, there's been a ton of new security features, and we want to highlight a couple that I think are going to be really important. Uh, one which is coming in really quickly is attachment sandboxing, and Nina is going to talk about that. And then we've gotten a lot of feedback on mail forwarding, so we want to make sure that you're aware of, of that. And then hopefully we'll have enough time for a Q&A session. So I think we have a full agenda for an hour. So, uh, so let's keep going. Um, all right, so why are we interested in security? Why is security such an important topic? You know, there's been a, a, a lot of things going on in, uh, but, but really we're seeing both an increased volume. So there's a significantly increased volume of attacks and it's, it coincides with everything that's been going on with remote work uh, and changes in people's environments and configurations. But clearly, you know, there's a growth industry here around cyber attacks. But it, worse than that, in addition to the increased volume, we're seeing an increased sophistication. Uh, and that has a couple of flavors. First of all, it means that in many cases, partners are getting attacked directly because of the credentials and systems that you have that provide access to your customers. So you are a prime target. And we're seeing a, a much higher degree of sophistication in terms of social engineering that attackers are using when they're doing attacks both on you and on customers. You know, for example, the, there's been a whole spate of new phish, of phishing attacks, which refers to voicemail. So it combines voice uh, calls uh, and and emails, really social engineering to leverage uh, the move to remote work is one vector that these are taking. And so the the bottom line is that there's a, there are a lot more sophisticated approaches that are coming into play. Many of them do not use any recognizable payloads. So they're using techniques 
that uh, are very difficult to address by using signatures of attached files or known bad URLs or bad domains or things like that. They're being very, very creative uh, in terms of how the attacks are structured. They can be multi-part attacks that try to get you engaged and then follow up. So there's a lot going on. And a big part of what we're trying to do is to help you provide the best possible protection for your customers uh, and, and for your own business. So in view of that, I'm going to introduce Alex, who's going to talk about one of the major initiatives that are, are now that's now coming online to help you address this. Thank you, Craig. Uh, right. So I think just to add to what Craig said there as well, um, a trend that we're definitely seeing as well as the sophistication increasing is that the targets um, are much more likely now to be smaller businesses than larger businesses. Um, and we tend to see this when uh, technology um, comes onto the market that can help. It's typically reserved for, you know, it's at a price point that is potentially un unachievable or hard to get at for smaller businesses. Um, and really a lot of what I think about and a lot of what I'm trying to do to protect you and your customers is to um, make that happen, is to bring those enterprise features and capabilities down um, to the market where we think it can be uh, most applicable. Um, so here is the current email protection suite. So the email protection product is uh, focused around two key categories. One is prevention, so stopping the threats getting through. Uh, but it's also important that should a threat make it through, there is some way of detecting that and recovering that. So that's the kind of the life cycle, I suppose, the holistic view. Um, we have been putting a lot of thought and capability into email protection um, over the last few months um, and years, based on the last year, I would say. Um, a lot of that work is now coming to fruition. Um, what I want to talk about today is something I'm really excited about. It's a partnership with a very, very exciting um, vendor technology that we've partnered with. We've been talking to them for nearly a year now, vetting the technology, getting it integrated into our platform. Uh, and we're right now at the point where we're able to talk to you about it, our partners, um, and the benefits that it will bring uh, to you. Uh, the technology or the capability is called AI Guardian. And the fundamental difference between our existing solution um, our existing solution operates as a gateway. So the messages travel through, or the inbound messages, I should start with, travel into our gateway solution. And we do as much protection and detection as we can on those messages. And then we deliver them to the mailbox. Um, now, a gateway solutions of the traditional approach, I suppose, uh, they're not going away. But what AI Guardian will do is augment the gateway scan with um, a additional protection layer that is applied at the inbox itself. So, you know, a lot of these attack vectors um, that are traditionally very hard for gateway solutions to actually know about, um, a lot of the things that Craig mentioned in the prior slides there, these new kind of modern payload less attacks, uh, they're very hard to detect at the gateway. And also the gateway really only gets one shot at it. So it has to make an assessment at that point in time prior to delivering the message. Uh, AI Guardian being that it's protecting the mailbox itself, it gets to see threats that potentially have passed through that gateway and it gets to provide a kind of ongoing protection, if you will, on that mailbox. Uh, so as well as detecting these new attack vectors, it can also automatically re automatically remediate the threats if they get found or detected in the mailbox itself. So prior, where the gateway had to basically deliver it and almost fire and forget, um, AI Guardian can now take an action on messages that have already been delivered. So it can pull messages out of the mailbox. It can apply tags to them. It can send them to the quarantine. Uh, it can make actions either manually so I'll show you a demo, uh, demo gods be willing, I'll show you a demo of um, the user interface where you can go in and actually see these threats occurring in essentially real time and manually remediate them. But you'll also be able to apply policies so that if a threat's detected, it can automatically take an action. So the key takeaway here is that it's applying the protection at the mailbox. If, if you hear nothing else, take that away. 
So how it actually works, what's the, what's the AI, what's the kind of, you know, interesting difference, I suppose. Um, if you know anything or uh, even anything, uh, a small amount about gateway solutions, they already use some sophisticated AI modeling to understand threats and to detect threats. But the models that we use uh, in our gateway solution are they're global models. So they're looking for um, they're looking for patterns in messages that uh, apply to the, uh, everybody, effectively things that are threatening the global landscape. So we license and partner with a lot of technology vendors that have you know scanners and honeypots all around the globe looking for um, attacks. And then when they detect those attacks, they push out. Uh, signatures or heuristic rules that allow the gateway products to do what they do. The real difference here with AI Guardian is that it builds models that are very specific to your users right the way down to the mailbox level. So we build models that are specific to your organization or to your customer's organization. So it's constantly um, understanding who you communicate with uh, on a frequent basis, what is a normal pattern of behavior versus what is an abnormal pattern of behavior. And we'll see a little bit of this in the demo. But as well as looking at the statistical uh, analyses, so who's talking to who, it will also use natural language understanding techniques to understand the um, various patterns of speech or patterns of text used within the email. So for those of you who um, are aware of kind of security education or email security education, a lot of the things that we teach our end users to look out for are things like urgency. You know, uh, it, you know, is it is there something that somebody's asking you to do quickly? You know, is it from somebody that you don't recognize? All of these types of patterns uh, that are fundamental, really, to understanding or detecting or a human being detecting a threat. We build models that actually do that exact same job. So it's an augment, I suppose, to your security education. So, you know, you can imagine the AI guardian, like looking over your user's shoulder, kind of keeping them safe, reading those messages with them. It's kind of that, if you will. So there are a number of kind of modern techniques that AI guardian uses, as well as machine learning, statistical techniques and natural language understanding. And then it uses deep learning techniques to continually improve those models. So every time an email is being delivered, it gets augmented, it augments the existing models, uh, and it, it's a constant basis. So what we find is that you switch these things on and you get an excellent level of uh, protection, but then the longer these models are running, they're constantly self-improving. That's the uh, deep learning or machine learning elements kicking in there. Um, and the level of protection and the accuracy of the detection goes up and up and up uh, right from the start. So. That's a lot of kind of buzzwords I'm aware uh, going on here, but it truly gives an indication into the techniques that are uh, really adding value, I suppose, on top of what's available today. So here we go. I've made my offering to the demo gods. We are going to attempt to do a live demo, which is always exciting. So bear with me while I just set this up now. Okay. Hey, while you're, doing that, while you're doing that, Alex, let me remind everybody that everybody who attends will be getting a recording of today's presentation. Uh, so, um, you know, if you've missed anything, you don't need to take notes, you'll get, the, you'll get the full recording of today's session. Exactly. Thank you, Craig. So um, the first thing, this is actually a real tenant. This is Intermedia. We have been eating our own dog food. We've been testing this for um, around about six months now, uh, we've had this running in our environments, um, reading, um, protecting our mailboxes, and ultimately doing everything that I just described. So this is a live environment. Uh, the first thing it's showing me, though, this dashboard is a, a high level view, I suppose, of threats coming into the organization or potential threats coming into the organization. So we can narrow this down. I can look at threats over the past month and I can start looking for trends. Uh, we can see the types of threats, whether they're, you know, social engineering, uh, whether it's phishing, payroll, extortion, all of that kind of good stuff. Um, but here is a kind of high level view, I suppose. So I'm um, giving you an indication into changes or trends that will be affecting you specifically. And when I say you, I mean your customer. So, you know, you can look in this dashboard as a way of understanding whether you're being more or less targeted by any specific types of attacks. 
Um, and then there's some interesting insights here around, you know, who are your uh, most impacted VIPs or persons, you know, who are the people that are ultimately coming under, you know, most attack, if you will, um, with some trend analysis there. So that's extremely useful um, to get some indication, I suppose, if you're in this dashboard about uh, trends that might be impacting you. But we can do a lot more. We can actually come in here and do a bit of uh, understanding the threats themselves. Uh, so if I go to this threats tab over here on the left, what you'll see here are all of the threats that have occurred in the past uh, roughly six months uh, targeting our organization, so my organization, Intermedia. Um, and we can apply filters here so we can you know, drill in and, and try and understand uh, any specific threats that we're interested in. But once I found a threat, I'll pick one of these. Uh, some payroll fraud here, apparently affecting Gloria, who works in our payroll department. So here is a threat. Uh, it's a person who's impersonating someone called Carlos. He actually does work in our organization. Um, AI Guardian knows that Carlos Caber here actually typically uses his intermediate email address. So it's unusual that a person with that name would use this Gmail address. So immediately there's some kind of, you know, something is up there. Um, there's a fraud risk that's been highlighted because this person here is requesting some deposit information from a suspicious address. And then also there's this statistical analysis here that's saying uh, this Gmail address very rarely, in this case, only once has ever communicated with um, the potential mark here, Gora, in this case. So we can see you know, how the various models work together to perform an overarching analysis that ultimately leads to some kind of um, uh, prediction, I suppose. Um, further to that, we can actually potentially see the natural language understanding. So if we actually look at the email content of this message, we can see here that the engine highlights the elements, the natural language elements within the email that triggered certain, um, certain models. So here we can see you know, the word direct deposit and bank account triggers financial, um, financial verbs, financial, financial terms. Uh, we've got a request here as well. You know, that's the bit highlighted in purple. So these layered up will uh, provide the models or give the models more to go on um, as, as it's assessing each individual threat. So in this case here, the threat was automatically remediated. Um, and I'll show you how in a second we have policies that uh, can basically define how these are handled. Um, but equally, a administrator can come into this portal and manually remediate actions. So this is particularly interesting when you're rolling out the solution. So initially, you might want to roll out by just tagging messages. And then as you get more, um, as you get more confidence with the solution and as the solution automatically learns through its deep learning, machine learning, it increases its accuracy. You can then come in here and start applying automatic policies. And in this case, if it's a payment fraud from outside the organization, it will automatically delete and send an alert to our security team. So that's, uh, you'll see here, you know, automatic remediation. The user doesn't even necessarily know that that message ever hit their inbox. AI Guardian has remediated that threat even before they've seen it. So I'm gonna pause at this point as well, stop the screen share. Craig, if you wouldn't mind bringing that um, presentation back. Yep. All right, thank you. So that was the demo, uh, went reasonably well. One thing I do wanna call out though is most of the capability or much of the capability I demonstrated there is going to be a part of our premium package. So AI Guardian, the features within AI Guardian um, are gonna be more premium. Now there is obviously a reason for that and it, it's ultimately down to cost. There are costs to us to deliver this incredible technology. However, there are capabilities within the suite that I felt very strongly we should be bringing to all customers. So um, working with our technology provider, we came to uh, some agreements whereby we're able to bring a number of capabilities to all customers. So anybody on email protection standard, we will be um, providing extortion, ransomware, and credential phishing protection for. Now, these are the ones that are most applicable or most broadly applicable to uh, many, many users. Um, and the goal there is that, you know, we really want to protect you and your customers and we want to stop the bad guys. So 
you know, applying this level of capability to everybody will immediately, um, you know, apply more protection. Um, so we will, in our standard package, only be offering the tagging, the message tagging. So things like automatic remediation, access to the dashboard, and a number of these advanced models will only be available in the premium feature. But you know, this will be coming at a very compelling price point. We will be talking more about this in the very near future. So speaking of the future, I'll talk a little bit about the enablement process here. Um, so right now we're rolling out the standard features. So you would have received a notification that this is coming to uh, an account near you over the next um, couple of months. So through November, December, um, because we're working with a third party, we are allowing you at any time to opt out. So um, should you preemptively want to opt out of the solution, you can go into the control panel and do that right now uh, or during enablement or after enablement. Um, in order to provide you and for you to provide your customers with uh, enough notification time, we're doing a three-stage notification. You've already received the initial notification. Um, and if you haven't, by all means, we can resend that to you. But prior to enabling this for your account, we'll then send you another kind of two-week warning, I suppose, a reminder that this is happening. And then when we switch on uh, and enroll, we'll send you another one. Now, because we're rolling this feature out domain by domain or pod by pod, there is going to be staggered notifications. So as we roll this up, it takes a huge amount of 100, 900,000 mailboxes. We have to go at a relatively kind of steady pace. Um, that said, you will be receiving notifications, potential, potentially multiple notifications um, where you've got customers across multiple exchange domains or exchange pods. So just be aware of that. Um, if you've received the initial notice, you'll know that we strongly recommend uh, that you notify your customers that this is happening, um, that, you know, there is a third party, you know, according to our um, privacy disclosure policies, all of that good stuff, make them aware that this is obviously a third party um, capability uh, delivering this service. Uh, we have a whole white paper and the white paper goes into a lot of detail about how the third party is integrated, the capability they provide and how this third party protects the data as well. So um, we put together that white paper specifically to answer a lot of those questions should they arise. Um, and of course, we're here as well to support you on those questions. So once that mailbox processing is complete and it can take time, um, upwards potentially of a week or two weeks, depending on the size of uh, the number of mailboxes on an account. Mailbox, uh, sorry, body tags will then start being applied to messages. And again, there are examples of all of these body tags in KB articles and in that white paper as well. Um, and that's all the standard enablement. Then next year, early Q1, January next year, we will then start rolling out the premium features. Uh, and again, we'll be following up with communications on all of that. So. There's a lot going on there. Uh, I, I'll stop at that point. I appreciate I've taken a lot of time already. Uh, Craig, over to you for. <clears> that's right. Hey, th hey, thank thank you, Alex. You know, this is a, this is the start of a long process. We're really excited about this technology. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot more about this, but we've started the initial stage, as Alex described. Now, he referred to a white paper. We'll include that as a follow up for everybody who attends today. So you'll get a copy of that. And I'll also be talking about other ways that we're going to be making that available. Um, uh, and uh, and we, we can talk more about this during the Q&A. But I wanted to introduce the encryption topic and the end of life messages that have been sent out. So user-based encryption, has secure, secure mail, has been around for quite a while. Um, but what we've seen over time is that the use has has declined, and that and as a result of that, the the vendor that we've worked with that provides the technology uh, has announced that they're discontinuing that service. So as a result of that, we've we're trying to provide as early notification as we can. So the service is going to end effective March first next year, uh, and that means that after that time, it's it's not going to function in the it's not it's it's not going to function. In, in the way that it's functioning today. So we want to make that aware, make you aware of that. So the notifications have been sent out, um, but there are a number of things that are going on that we want that are that are tied to this that I'm going to talk about. But for the EOL, 
those notifications went out, we have a secure mail FAQ that answers the specific steps or that addresses the specific steps uh, that you may want to take in terms of um, deprovisioning, uninstalling, but retaining the ability to review the encrypted messages that have been sent with the secure mail add-on um, and how to handle that decommissioning and deprovisioning process. Now, there are a number of options that are going to be available, and we'll talk. This will make more sense when I talk about the policy-based encryption. You know, there are a large number of customers that are, are using policy-based encryption in addition to user-based encryption, and so. For those, well, I'm going to talk about uh, in a minute how policy-based encryption may be the replacement that they need. Obviously, in other cases, if there is a strong encryption requirement, then policy-based encryption, which is continuing and has a number of enhancements that I'm going to get into in a minute, may be the, a very desirable option. You know, finally, if you have customers that have used user-based encryption in a very limited fashion, then of course there's a path there to just deprovision, uninstall, but retain the ability to have those messages uh, re reviewable and, and saved and, and readable. And that's all. That's all part of the um, FAQ and instruction materials that we're providing. Why is this happening? So, you know, use, as I mentioned, user-based encryption has been around for a while, but we've also had policy-based encryption. You know, they, they both do encryption in, in different ways. Um, and what we've seen over time is that at, although user-based encryption originally was a state-of-the-art solution, the way that it was set up um, provides additional overhead both for users and for administrators because it has to be installed at each user, provisioned individually, which means that the add-in and software has to be installed for, for each user. Um, you know, that's that's something the user has to invoke if they want to if they want to take advantage of that. User-based encryption doesn't have there's no web uh, version of the add-on, there's no mobile device support, so those so web and mobile access really don't work. Also, authentication is a pretty cumbersome process. You have to use your credentials every time you want to send or receive an encrypted message. So from user experience, you know, what we've seen over time is that the policy-based encryption offers some significant advantages, both because it's transparent to the end user, uh, you know, th there's nothing that's, requi that's required of them. Uh, encryption is triggered based on the policies that you enable. You know, many partners have, have told us how they use the web and mobile uh, device as part of how they demo the use of encryption. So it's got a great experience for, for, mobile, for mobile devices. Um, and then authentication has a different role. There are many cases where you sorry, you don't need it at all to send because that's handled automatically. And you can set up the modes that you want to use so it may or may not be required for recipients. On the admin side, there are also some important implications. You know, because the message is in because it requires a plugin, you as an admin, you have work to do for each for each user. But also because the messages are encrypted, they're impervious to indexing. Uh, and so that means that search and discovery aren't possible. Um, so they're they're not useful in the sense of having them archived and, and searchable. Also, from a security standpoint, there are some issues because the messages, as they're encrypted, can't be scanned for antivirus or anti-malware or anti-spamming controls. Um, and you know, as many of you have discovered, uh, when users t lose credentials, you know that can be a painful process. Well, credential credentials, managing credentials with user-based encryption, it can be particularly complicated. So for all of those reasons, you know, we've, we've seen a, a much stronger trend to adopt policy-based encryption, um, you know, because it's transparent, because it supports mobile devices, um, because the ability to customize the policies and just have that happen without use, requiring user interaction is preferable. And again, because these messages can be part of your archive, searchable, discoverable, retrievable. Um, and then also scannable for, for security purposes. So I know that there are certain use cases where user-based encryption is very different from policy-based encryption, but the trend has been really clear. And so the EOL kind of forces, forces the issue um, uh, and creates a decision point about what the migration path is that you want to propose for your clients. At the same time, 
we're actually introducing some new enhancements to policy-based encryption that make that even more attractive. Um, and these are gonna become available shortly. So we had to announce the EOL. We want to provide as much notice as possible now, but we'll be providing, I'm providing some of this now, and we will be providing more information as we roll this out, uh, in, you know, likely in December or possibly the end of this month. So the advantages for policy-based encryption are going to include some new capabilities for delivery. So in addition to some of the web portal uh, d delivery methods that have already been placed, there are going to be some new PDF uh, options. Um, and also, uh, there are going to be additional options for, for user control over what is encrypted. So expanded delivery in terms of PDFs and, and methods. Um, you know, users can choose which delivery options they want. Uh, you know, better key and certificate management options with this new version, better control over what's encrypted, not everything. So the user can pick whether it's just the, just the attachment or the message or both and how it's delivered. Um, and then there are also some additional authentication options, including the use of, of uh, social media credentials through OAuth support for Facebook, LinkedIn, and Google, if that's an option, if that's a desirable option for, for customers. And I think the big thing that's brand new is that with this new version, uh, with this new release, we'll have the ability to provide a add-in. So secure mail, secure mail add-in going away for user-based encryption, a new add-in that's an option for policy-based encryption. So a user can have a very similar experience to the secure mail experience that they had, um, but it actually works better because it doesn't have the same overhead in terms of uh, requiring cr credentials. So we think that in many cases, this will be a very, very attractive alternative. And it really depends on you know, how they're using, using user-based encryption today. For example, if they have, if they're using both policy-based encryption and user-based encryption, then as we release the policy-based encryption enhancements with the add-on that's coming soon, and we'll provide an update on the availability, you know, swapping the plugin and you know, also doing some not maintenance but operational work about retrieving the messages that they've sent should be a good solid migration path. If they've only been using user-based encryption, but they're very interested in using encryption, then policy-based encryption with these new enhancements may be a very attractive offer. Um, on the other hand, if they've had very limited use of user-based encryption, then the simplest path may be to just disable, uninstall, follow the steps in the in the FAQ um, to save those messages and make them make them readable. Preserve preserve that work. Preserve the keys in case you need to access them in the future. All those steps are outlined in the FAQ that we've provided that's linked from the end of life message that you got. We also have this um, a site which we've set up um, that, I'll, that I'll reference that, in, that both lists the instructions and then also provides these same resources. So, so we want to get this um, uh, over to you now because we have to provide the EOL notification, but I think I'd like to suggest a thoughtful approach based on what's coming with policy-based encryption as you're considering what the best option is for your customers. And we'll, we'll talk more about this in the, in the Q&A. And, and how to follow up. Okay, next topic. We have had for a while advanced email protection for Office 365 as an option for Office 365 plans. Um, you know, we think that it's an attractive option for our partners for a couple of reasons. First, because it has the same experience that you're familiar with on the Exchange side, in terms of how in terms of how it works. Um, also, it has some advantages over what's included with Microsoft's uh, Exchange Online protection. You know, Microsoft has a lot of technology options, but in many cases, they can be complicated, um, difficult to difficult to set up. Uh, and less than optimal from a user perspective. The advantages of advanced email protection, the, the advanced email protection that we provide, is that specifically in, includes malicious link and gray mail protection. So obviously we, we think that our 
email protection solution is a great solution, you know, by bundling multiple best of breed security engines. But from a functionality standpoint, um, you know, the off the shelf it, in, by including malicious link protection through LinkSafe uh, and gray mail management features that Microsoft doesn't include with Exchange online protection, you know, we think that that's a that that's a, a very attractive option. Now, what we've just done is we've made this accessible within Host Pilot. So it was available on request previously. This can now be uh, provisioned from Host Pilot, just like our other services for email, for email protection. The battle cards and information about this are in the partner sales portal. Um, so we have the data sheets uh, and the and battle cards like I'm showing you that that show how to compare it and how to and how to pitch it. Um, and so if you if it was not attractive before because you had to manually request this, this be turned on, it's now available in the control panel. Uh, you can turn it on for, for your customers immediately. That's an option that you want to pursue. Okay, now I'd like to turn the discussion over to Nina Underover, who's going to talk about some other, another important new security feature that we're launching. Yeah, thank you, Craig. Um, so yeah, um, as um, was said previously, um, in the beginning of this webinar, um, attacks are evolving very quickly nowadays. And um, we need uh, more and more layers of protection uh, against uh, new attacks. So um, very soon we are going to introduce attachments and box scan uh, feature. Um, it, this is additional layer of protection. Uh, will identify attachments that may contain malicious executable code, such as macro-enabled documents, for example, and uh, it will automatically submit them for additional processing in the uh, safe sandbox environment. The sandbox will open the attachment and analyze all changes to processes, file activities, registry activity, and network connections before a decision is made. Is uh, this attachment safe or is it dangerous? Um, it's going to be an additional option inside inbound and outbound policies, additional to our current uh, options uh, in attachment protection. That option should be checked in the user interface to start working with it. So there will be some changes um, in um, message deliveries. So original message will be delivered immediately to user um, to end user mailboxes in case attachments were suspicious and were analyzed by attachments and box scan and turned out to be safe uh, they will be deliver delivered to end user mailbox in a follow-up message but there could be delay in delivery up to 20 minutes but um, in most cases it will be less uh, than 20 minutes so um, it's a very powerful option um, against executable code in attachment. Um, so um, basically how it works, uh, engine will determine attachments as noun good, a noun bad or unknown. A noun good attachment will be delivered, a noun bad will be blocked, and uh, unknown attachment uh, will be uh, analyzed at, uh, in sandbox environment. Um, so if file end up uh, be safe after execution, it will be released to end user in a follow-up message. If it will end up to be dangerous after um, inspection in sandbox environment, action set up in your pol in um, account policy will be applied. So. Um, this new um, additional layer of protection we'll, uh, we, are, we are going to introduce in November. And uh, you will get additional notification about it. Um, in order to enable it uh, for account, uh, it should be done through user interface. So we are not going to enable it on uh, behalf of uh, customers. 
I think that's all for for attachment box scan. Yeah. And now I cake, please. Okay. Hey, thanks, Nina. I think Alex, were you gonna take this? Yeah, I just quickly uh, wanted to mention this. This this I think is an interesting update for those of you who attend these frequently. Um, I've mentioned this before how as well as adding security features into our products and our email protection products and others, um, we are always also looking at the security capabilities of the platform in general. And what that means for the email platform, um, we obviously have a exchange, hosted exchange environment uh, that powers our solution. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is look at um, or provide a lot more kind of notification when we identify suspicious things happening. Now, they may be suspicious, they might may be entirely benign. Um, we can't always make that assessment. Sometimes it's better that the customer or the end user makes that assessment. Uh, and in this case, um, mailbox forwarding rules was an area that we saw were being um, manipulated or abused, I suppose, in our system, where compromised mailboxes uh, would have a, a suspicious, well, a mailbox forwarding rule, forwarding messages to an external mailbox, um, and then the attacker would leave the system. So they wouldn't do anything overt. They wouldn't do anything. They're very hard to detect. The end users wouldn't even know that their accounts had been compromised. But at the same time, all of their messages were being sent to an external person, you know, for follow up or for whatever reason. Um, now, this situation was something that we deemed we would be able to quite easily understand. And we introduced the mailbox forwarding rule or the suspicious forwarding alert. Um, I just wanted to call out this. We got some really great feedback on this. It's something that's very easy for us to detect. It's very deterministic. Um, and by notifying, um, in the partner's case, we're notifying you when we detect that these things have happened. Now, should it be, the alert kind of gives you as the partner um, advice on what to do, you know, find out was that, you know, intentional or not intentional, it might be perfectly safe, but just be aware that this thing has happened. Um, now, you know, I just want to make, just wanted to bring this up at this point to really hammer home that it's not just about security products and features. You know, we're always working behind the scenes as well to add in capability that make you and your customers safer. Great. Right. Hey, thank, hey, thanks, Alex. Okay, so we're about to segue into the Q&A, but I did want to flag the security toolkit that we have set up for partners that is at that URL, gointermedia.net, uh, security assets. And so we'll be adding the, the white paper, the AI Guardian white paper uh, to it, but it's a place where you can find additional product information, videos by Alex, Ryan Barrett, uh, um, Boyan Dusevic, you know, other product managers talking about how to use the security features within different services, and then also templates, emails that you can use to send to customers to notify them, hey, we're turning this on, we want to make sure that, that you're aware of this. We also have a guide to protecting your inbox that you can customize uh, and send to customers that reminds them about security principles. You know, I think as good as AI Guardian is going to be, we're always going to make we're always going to, to depend on users to be kind of a final line of educated support scanning uh, scanning emails. So we're trying to arm you with as in, in, in as many ways as we can to help you protect your customers and help protect your business. Okay, so with that, we're going to segue to the q and I wanted to st actually start with a poll because we've had two kind of big topics that we've talked about, um, and we're super interested in your feedback today. Love to get your feedback about whether you want more depth in these topics, um, whether there's something that we didn't have a chance to cover, but specifically, we'd like to know if, if you uh, would like some follow-up uh, from our team on either of these two topics. So I think we're going to have a quick poll first about encryption. Uh, um, and we'll be, we'll be following up with you on, on this if it's, if it's something that you want some more discussion on. So, so please flag it here. Um, and we'll be reviewing the poll results at the end and making sure that anybody who asked for some follow-up um, gets that. So let me just keep going while we have a chance for people to answer. And if there's no further res responses, then let's proceed to the next question, which was about the AI Guardian. Um, you know, again, we're starting this process with enabling the basic features. There'll be a lot more to come. 
um, but I saw some good questions that we're going to be talking about during the Q&A session. Uh, and so we'd be happy to follow up with you uh, on this topic on this topic as well. So, you know, we intend to do a lot more of these events around security. Security is really important to our customers and, and partners. You know, if, if you're protecting your customers, you're protecting your own business. So we want to make sure that you're leveraging all of our, the security features that we're building in. You know, Alex and Nina are, are working super hard to make sure that the best security controls are available and easy for you to, to, to leverage. Um, Okay, so let's let this run for another couple seconds, and then, thank you, Kim. Why don't we segue to the to the Q and A? So I'll just bring a slide back up to to cover us, Alex, while we look at the Q and A that have accumulated during the session. Okay, so I see um, some questions about privacy and privacy and compliance for for AI for AI Guardian. Yeah. Um, Alex, do you want to start on that, or I can? Yeah, sure. I see a couple around this, um, and I'm sure this is in reaction to um, the, the comments that we're working with a third party to deliver this technology. So it's absolutely understandable that there would be privacy implications um, as we, you know, engage in that process. So um, I mentioned that we've been working with AI Guardian for well over a year now, and a lot of the reasons are. Um, the armor blocks of the company that help us deliver this capability. Now, as a third party, uh, we effectively treat them just as an extension of our environment and, and of our team. So all of the protections that we have in place around our environment, we expect from our third parties as well. So we've gone through a due diligence process. Um, there's obviously all of the um, compliance regulations that we hold ourselves to well, we need those, you know, we need uh, our providers and partners to reflect those same levels of standard as well. So um, that's absolutely the case. Um, and the white paper goes into a lot of the detail about how um, our technology partners uh, protect their environment in, you know, in the same way and provide that kind of same level of assurance that, that we Intermedia do as well. Um, as it relates to things like uh, sensitive data. So again, there's another question here around compliance concerns. Um, now, again, if it's something to do with um, right to be forgotten, GDPR, um, or you know other uh, related regulations, um, the third party vendor are, are, are responsive to us with regard to things like you know right to be forgotten requests and stuff like that. So as a part of our compliance due diligence with working with this third party, uh, we have to make sure that obviously we're covered off um, as, a, as a provider. So effectively, nothing really changes from your perspective. Um, we are delivering the same service. We're just doing it with the parties, but holding them to the same um, standards that we hold ourselves. One thing I will note, though, around the um, privacy of AI Guardian specifically, emails themselves are not held in the third party systems. Uh, the models and the analysis is done in the third party systems. And again, it's all SOC 2 type 2 regulated and audited. Um, but the actual messages are not being um, egressed out to a third party and held in some giant repository. That's just not the way it works. Um, the processing and the analysis, though, does take place there. And again, the white paper goes into more details, but should you have follow-up questions, um, talk to your account manager and we'll, we'll get those covered off. Hey, thanks, Alex. And we have a couple of versions. We have a version of the white paper that you can provide clients that you could um, um, put your own contact and, and branding on. Um, and of course, the other thing is that this is entirely optional. You know, we think we want customers who want you to take advantage of it, but it can be disabled at any time. It can be disabled preemptively um, uh, or after after the after it has been released. So. OK, so I'm aware of time, Craig. Do you want me to just roll through some of these questions here as well? Just want to That'd make sure great. we Covered off. Right. Okay, cool. Um, so I think there's more questions that came in relating to AI Guardian. One of them specifically around whether this replaces email protection um, or augments it. So just to be very clear, this is an additional layer that augments the existing email protection solution. Um, we are continually continuing to invest in email protection. And from my perspective, this is a capability of email protection, not any kind of replacement for it. So, you know, gateway scanning is absolutely still required. Um, and, you know, you can't not do one even though you're doing the AI stuff. So um, we absolutely are doing this as an additional layer on top. 
Um, another question on whether AI Guardian applies to ingress as well as egress, um, or only ingress or egress. It actually applies to both. So as well as inbound policies detecting threats and inbound threats, there are also DLP policies looking for um, compliance violations relating to PCI um, or personal, you know, or PII things like that. Um, there are also policies specifically look or models specifically looking for things like password exfiltration and sharing. So they apply on outbound communications. So it's both in and out. Um, there was another question on what gray mail meant. Uh, gray mail, as we refer to it, is effectively a legitimate marketing message. Um, it is not spam. Uh, it's also known as ham. Uh, it, usually it conforms to the can spam standard. So it has an unsubscribe um, link in it. It's sent via a legitimate bulk marketing platform. But you might not recognize it as something that you uh, you would want to receive. So that's gray mail. In our solution, we refer to it as marketing communications. So uh, improvements come into how we classify and handle uh, marketing or gray mail uh, was what that was about. Uh, a couple of questions on DMARC, uh, specifically inbound and incoming DMARC. Uh, so right now, no doubt you guys are aware we do apply DMARC signatures to outbound messages. We are adding DMARC uh, to our inbound flows. That is a roadmap item for next year. However, AI Guardian does do DMARC um, classification. It actually looks at DMARC signatures and verifies them um, on the inbound flow and looks at the DMARC policies as part of its uh, determination. Um, so it's not a complete implementation of DMARC. It doesn't send off um, you know, DMARC, uh, the DMARC emails to the policies upstream, but it does do DMARC checking. So it's a kind of interim, I suppose, partial solution while we implement the full inbound DMARC um, protection. Um, somebody's asking here whether any of these updates or changes have actually modified the, our default detection policies. Uh, they've noticed some changing uh, changes. Nothing we talked about today, and there's nothing I can think of that has changed um, around uh, our default policies or, or our default detection policies. Um, so there may be something at place there. So you know, if you ask that question, please bring it up to support and they'll be able to do a policy review and try and understand exactly, get to the root cause of any um, unusual behaviors that you've seen in your classifications. And a final question here around um, AI scanning. Do we use any of the email scanning for marketing? Uh, categorically, no. Um, this is um, this is uh, mentioned with um, in our privacy policy. So it, we are very, very um, resolute with this. And obviously our third party provider cannot also do any of this activity. So again, all of the processing that takes place is only for the purposes of providing protection, no marketing, no kind of other nefarious means. Um, and we stand by that and we adhere to that as a part of our policy and commitment to you. Yeah, that so, sucks. The question I've got there, Craig. Any more I've missed? Uh, no, I see some uh, more questions about um, uh, DMARC, but then also sand sandboxing. You know, we announced sandboxing today, or, or we wanted to provide you guys with an update. This this team, uh, our partners, with some information about the upcoming sandboxing. You'll be getting some more information on that shortly as we announce it. But we wanted to use today to. To, to flag that for you. So we'll, we, we will provide some more information about that. Also, there'll be a knowledge base article in addition to the, in, to, to the, other, into the announcements that we're going to send. Um, let's see. So uh, uh, very interested in your feedback on today's session. You know, I see a lot of comments. There's, there's a number of comments about DMARC that we'll follow up on. Um, and then, of course, the request for follow up on the AI Guardian and encryption. Everybody will get a copy of uh, today's uh, session, a recording, uh, white papers, uh, links to the sites that we've mentioned, the um, FAQ site for EOL, uh, a reminder about the toolkit site for, for the security assets. Um, but really appreciate appreciate your taking your time today. We know you, we know your time is valuable. We kind of had a jam packed session today. I appreciate all of the questions uh, and participation. And again, we'll be doing more more of these. So, thank you very much for participating in today's session.